So I think you heard about me when uh, Professor Horn was talking, but I was too busy getting my talk ready. So anyhow, I'm uh, Stacy Bent in the Chemical Engineering Department. I've been here a lot longer than the previous speaker. This is my, uh, about to start, I guess, my 17th year at Stanford. Uh, and I want to focus on um, nanomaterials for energy conversion. So I'm going to start kind of general, and then I'm going to focus in on one example of research that um, uses nanomaterials. <clears throat> so you have been hearing all week about, I'm sure, things related to the earth and sustainable energy and uh, different forms of energy. And uh, I'm sure you're aware that there is going to have to be multiple solutions to sustainable energy. There's not going to be one solution. Uh, lots of different technologies are going to be needed. We're looking at huge consumption of energy uh, that's rising all the time. And so we're going to need to look at different ways of solving energy, making it, storing it, and uh, transporting it, and so on. And so if you think about one vision, one possible vision for a sustainable energy future, that's what's shown here. And so this is this uh, center, SNEEK. Center for uh, Nanostructuring for Efficient Energy Conversion. So it was a, uh, is a Department of Energy uh, supported uh, Frontier Research Center. And we kind of devised this vision where you said, well, of course the sun, as I'm sure you've heard about in earlier presentations this week, is a huge source, our biggest source of renewable energy. So we want to harness that. We can go straight to electricity if we use photovoltaics. We might want to store that electricity. So we might use things like supercapacitors or batteries. Uh, we might want to use fuels. We really like fuels. Of course, we love electricity in, the, in this country and throughout the world, but we also like transportable energy so we can power our vehicles and move it around. So for fuels, we could actually take sunlight and directly form fuels, things like hydrogen, if we say split water with sunlight. You might want to use that uh, in something efficient to go back to electricity eventually, like a fuel cell. So there are all of these devices that uh, one might uh, envision in one of these kind of future scenarios. So interestingly, if you look at those different devices, things like batteries uh, or supercapacitors, fuel cells, solar cells, those all exploit similar physical and chemical phenomena. I want to kind of explain what those are. So each one creates a positive and negative charge carrier. So the simplest thing is an electron in a hole. Uh, it moves the charge around and it recombines the charge. And so one of the things we did in this center, SNEEK, is try to look at common threads in those processes that uh, are fundamental to photovoltaics, fuel cells, and so on, and figure out how we can improve the efficiency of those processes. So I'm just going to give you one example of one of those devices and show you how we make these charge carriers and move them around. And that's a photovoltaic. So this is just a solar cell. It basically takes light and converts it into electrical energy. And the way it works is light is absorbed. Okay? You generate charge carriers in a photovoltaic. So it's an electron in a hole, positive and negative, or negative and positive charge carrier. They move around, and then they recombine to uh, produce electricity. So you generate the carriers, you move them, and you recombine them. And if I went through the fuel cell and the battery and so on, you would see that the same process takes place. It's sometimes it's an electron and an ion and so on, but generally you have the same repeated process. So how can we improve that process? Okay. One way to do it is to make things smaller. And there are multiple reasons why making things smaller would make them better at moving charge around and generating charge, and I'm listing two here. One is that if things are smaller, charges don't have to move as far. So if you think about a solar cell, I mentioned that you generate electrons in one type of semiconductor. I didn't mention it, but this is the p-type, and you go into the n-type. If it has to move a long way to get to where you separate it, you're going to have losses. There are always losses in these materials. So if you make it smaller, fewer losses, better efficiency of that process. That's one reason. It's advantageous to make things smaller. A second reason is uh, you can actually, uh, when things become smaller, you can potentially absorb more light. You can be more efficient at absorbing the light. Um, and one way to do that is through a process called quantum confinement. And that's actually what I'm going to focus on uh, in today. But let me, let me just go back to this vision of a sustainable energy future and say, well, if we want to make things smaller, and you look at these devices I mentioned before, the photovoltaic, the battery, the uh, photoelectrochemical reactor, and the fuel cell, if you actually zoom in now to the guts of each one of those, they're already made up of lots of nanomaterials. So this is not necessarily anything new. Uh, they have lots of little things. Some of them are really structured. Some of them are more random. But they have lots of nanomaterials. And going forward, they're going to have even more nanomaterials. 
So go back to this. How do we make things better? We make them smaller. I'm going to focus on this light absorption aspect through quantum confinement. And I want to talk about quantum dots. Okay, so this is the one example I want to give you. What is a quantum dot? It's a very, very small nanoscale material out of a semiconductor. So it's a little particle of semiconductor. They're called quantum dots because they're so small that they uh, are subject to size quantization effects, so quantum effects, where the band gap, the electronic properties, are actually a function of the size of that particle. Okay, so these are actually all the same material. I think this is probably cadmium selenide. All the same quantum dot, just different sizes. And you can see the spectrum is changing just based on the size. And that's useful for something like light absorption because the uh, material absorbs sunlight based on its band gap or its absorption spectrum. So you can tailor the absorption spectrum by changing the size. So this is one reason that very small materials like quantum dots are of interest for more efficient solar cells. So what do they actually look like? These are some uh, lead sulfide quantum dots. My student just showed these images yesterday in a group meeting, and I said, oh, I love those. i got to show them tomorrow. So uh, these little things are actually the quantum dots. They're lead sulfide, and they're on top of sort of bigger particles of titanium dioxide. And you can see the scale here. So each one is just a few nanometers, and they're relatively uniform in size. And these all have really interesting optical properties. They absorb light really well. And if I were to change the size of this, the color at which it absorbed light would be different. So how do you use something like that in a solar cell? There are different ways. There are different structures. I'm going to talk about one, which is called a colloidal quantum dot solar cell. So you take all those little dots that I showed in this previous picture. We don't synthesize them like what's shown here, where they're sitting on a solid material. We make them in solution. And then we can spin them. These black dots are the quantum dots. We spin them on top of another semiconductor. This is titanium dioxide. It could either be rough, like I'm showing here, or it could be smooth. And you cap it off with some, uh, another electrode. This is transparent, so light will come in from this side, be absorbed by these quantum dots, and then electrons and holes are produced. You generate these charge carriers. They move around, and they're recollected uh, to get, give electricity. So you can tune the absorption by engineering the quantum dots. And also one reason this is nice is you can make it through solution. So it's cheap um, and relatively easy and scalable. So this is the kind of geometric picture of it. I want to talk a little bit about what this looks like in terms of the electronic structure. So I've drawn here some bands. This is a band diagram. And just to make it more clear, up here, this thing up here is what we call the conduction band. This is where if you generate an electron excited by absorbing light, it goes up here into the conduction band and moves around. And what you leave behind is a hole in the valence band, and that moves around. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about this picture. But again, light comes in, is absorbed here. The electrons have to make it over into this TiO2. That's shown here. They go this way, and the holes go out to the gold. So in order to explain what we're trying to do here, I'm going to give you an analogy that I use in one of the classes that I teach. And this actually comes from. Uh, Bruce Clemens, who uses it in a class as he teaches in material science, which is, this is again, this is the conduction band that I showed before here, conduction band, and valence band is down here. And if you want to think about what electrons and holes do in these bands, you can think about this as tanks of water. I really like this analogy. So the tank here is your solid. Water is the electron. So this bottom tank is filled with water. The top one has no water in it. And your electric field that you apply in a device is what you think of as tilting the tank. Okay? So if we tilt this tank and it's full in the bottom and empty in the top, nothing's going to happen. Water can't move here. There's no water in the top, so nothing occurs. So the tilt, or the electric field, doesn't produce any flow of, in our real case, the electrons and holes. But now what you do when you excite a system like this with light is you are bringing up electrons to the conduction band or little droplets of water to this empty tank. And you're leaving behind little bubbles or holes in the bottom tank. Okay, these are the holes in the valence band. And now if you tilt it or apply an electric field, you see that the electrons go down. They like to fall down on this band. And holes, like bubbles, like to move up. And that's exactly the way we think about electrons going like to go down in energy in the bands. And holes like to go up in their valence band. Okay. This is going to be useful, because now we have to think about what these quantum dots do. Okay, So this is another view of this quantum dot cell. There's just a bunch of quantum dots together wedged between your semiconductor and your conductor on top. 
And the quantum dots have a particular gap between them. Again, I'm not showing the whole conduction bound, but that's above these lines and the valence bounds below these. And if we don't do anything special to it, there's really not that much of a tilt, okay? But the electrons we know have to make it over to here, and the holes need to make it out this way. And there are a lot of losses when you have a device that looks like that because it's kind of slow for the electrons to move and the holes to move. So what if we did our version of tilting that by making a gradient in these uh, band positions of the different quantum dots so that, see, now the electrons trickle down and the holes bubble up? And this might be a more efficient way of removing electrons and holes in these quantum dot devices. And so that's the general idea behind this system. So let me tell you how we do it. We actually synthesize the quantum dots through a technique called hot injection synthesis. So you start with lead and you add some sulfur and you put them in a, a reactor that's very air sensitive, so it has to be done under, under vacuum or nitrogen conditions in what's called a Schlenk line. And you make these particles and you can measure their optical absorption spectrum. This is measured um, with a spectrometer, but they would have a certain color that you would see peaking here at about 900 nanometers. And if you put them down and do transmission electron microscopy, you can see all these black things are the quantum dots. So this is a different image. They're sort of packed here, so you see they're nice, uniform quantum dots. When you make them the way I showed you with that hot injection synthesis, the quantum dots, these little particles of semiconductor, they're actually coated by organic ligands. So you can't make the cell work very well with these big ligands on it because they separate the quantum dots too far and it's hard for the electrons or holes to hop around. So you swap it out for something smaller. And there's a process by which you do that um, on the film. So what we were trying to do here is look at this fundamental idea that if we tilted those bands the way I showed you, would we be able to get better performing devices? And to do that, we picked three ligand molecules that are going to go around those quantum dots that have very specific properties. They are interesting because they all bond to the quantum dot through this group here at the bottom. And they all have dipole moments that are different. Okay, Nitro groups uh, are very electron withdrawing, so it pulls electrons this way. Methyl pushes electrons this way and fluorine somewhere in the middle. So we actually can change the, the dipole moment around these quantum dots and that's going to allow us to shift those energy levels in the bands. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this one with the nitro group has kind of a lower uh, conduction band and valence band, sorry, valence and conduction band. And then as you go, it's shifting up like this and we've done calculations that show what the dipole moment is, and there's a nice correlation between the ionization potential or where these energies sit and the molecule we put on it. Okay, we do calculations, uh, quantum calculations to really look carefully at what these bands are doing as we add the different molecules on it, some push charge in, some pull charge out. And what we're trying to do is control the level of those bands so that we can pull charge out better in a solar cell. And then we put it all together and we make a cell like this. Okay, so these are all the quantum dots. They're so tightly packed you can't really see the separate quantum dots. This is the uh, thin layer of TiO2, which is your semiconductor. And this whole thing is just a transparent electrode. And what we do is we take some of this and we make it with one of those dipole moments, molecules, and the other layer with a different dipole moment. And we try to see if we can make the charge collection better. So this is our standard one. Remember with the flat bands, it's not really helping the electrons and holes be pulled out. This would be the ideal case where we've twisted it or tilted it so the electrons like to come this way and holes like to bubble up. And this way kind of ruins it. We sort of make a barrier in there which is hard for electrons and holes to go past. And uh, I won't go into detail about how we do the measurement but we make solar cells out of this and then we look at how they perform. And what we see is that the uh, one where we get this sort of cascade in the favorable direction does have more efficiency than the control. And when we intentionally make it bad by shifting the bands the wrong way, it gets worse. Okay, so just to sum up this one little vignette, um, we're trying to really understand how we can use engineering of these quantum dots to make better efficiency of charge collection, which is a big part of that cycle you need to make a photovoltaic device. Um, and we show that if we can align the bands, we can improve the performance. And the main conclusion here is that nanoscale materials, like the ones I showed you here in this example, are going to play an important role in uh, future energy conversion devices. 
Uh, this is my research group. Um, and the students and postdocs who were involved in the work I just told you about are shown here. This is funded by the SNEAK, uh, this Department of Energy Research Center. We have just moved into uh, this new building, the Sri Ram Center, which isn't very far from here. So uh, this is the view from one of the balconies. If you haven't been in that building yet, I encourage you to come see it. It's beautiful. Um, some of the best views on campus can be found in, in that building. And I think with that, I will uh, stop and see if you guys have any questions. You, you, well, you need the ligands, one, because that's how you synthesize them. They're there to stabilize them so they don't all uh, compress together and form one big uh, mass of material. And also they passivate the surface, which otherwise would be a de source of defects. So your charge would get trapped at those sites at the surface. So they, they're sort of there to protect the electronic properties of the quantum dot. You can make them without ligands, and some of the cells we do don't have them. But then you're always worried about um, defect states and impurities at, the, at that interface at the surface. Yeah. So instead, we try to use them to our advantage and move the electronic properties around using those ligands. Yes? This isn't a dumb question. If you have a bunch of ligands that have dipole moments and they're symmetrically oriented around the quantum dot, how does that generate a net electric field um, along the junction? Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's a very good question. We've discussed that ourselves among, among the group working on this. I think the better way to think about this is that um, you're effectively doping uh, those quantum dots by donating charge in or pulling electrons out. So if you look carefully at one of those images I showed, they, um, what's, what's changing very slightly is the position of the band uh, relative to the Fermi level. So it's sort of more p-type or more n-type. And that's actually what's causing the tilt that would lead to any difference in the photovoltaic device. Otherwise, it's right. I mean, you have a symmetry issue with, with uh, the field applied to these. Um, the measurement is an experimental measurement, so you do see that you're shifting the ionization potential by these different uh, ligands. Yes? Is the junction of the solar cell actually flat? In this solar cell or in general? Or? In, in, in yeah. this solar cell. In our solar cell, it is flat. Um, we, yeah, right, well, relatively flat. I mean, this is the, this is the junction. So here's your uh, p-type material, the quantum dots, and this thin little thing, which is, you know, I guess it's not that flat, is your n-type material. But some of these designs intentionally with this kind of quantum dot solar cell are intentionally very, very rough. So it's a really porous layer here. We make a flat one, but they could be really porous. And they still work fine, actually. So there are some designs of solar cells where um, you want it to be really rough because you want to have a lot of material there to absorb the light, and by roughening it, you get more material. Um, it turns out it's not necessary in, in this type of cell. Uh, but So they can be flat or rough. I mean, what's really important is the quality of that interface, because otherwise, you'd, again, you have loss by trapping the electrons or holes at the interface. Yes. Um, what is the interaction with the semiconductor industry and money? Um, I mean, so the landscape is it a completely different one, or um, so what are the yeah? Is it I always think of making uh, the types of semiconductors you need for photovoltaics and a lot of these devices I showed you as being what's really easy for the semiconductor industry. Because the semiconductor industry, I mean, these are, these are nanometers, so these are small. But your standard silicon solar cell and the patterning you have on it, it's, it's huge compared to what the microelectronics industry is dealing with. Those things are down to like 35 nanometers routinely across an entire uh, wafer. So. That's actually why I think um, I'm very hopeful about advances being made in solar cells, because we have the technology. And a lot of the technologies that my group uses to make interesting designs of solar cells are just borrowed from the semiconductor industry. It's kind of the easy stuff for them. Um, so I think these length scales, I mean, nanometer is kind of where they've been operating, and they mass produce already. They do it differently. I mean, they have a lot of lithography, and it's very expensive. 
So their uh, cost basis is really different. Uh, you have to do things really cheaply for solar cells. You can charge a lot for uh, you know, an Intel chip. And you can't charge a lot for that size of a solar cell, right? Um, but the technologies can borrow, and they often do from each other. Yeah? How, do the, how does the function of these uh, little quantum dot solar cells change over time? Like, is it very stable or sensitive to moisture? Yeah, it depends. These ones, this material system is relatively stable. Uh, some of them within minutes are already completely different. They've oxidized from exposure to air. So what you find is in most solar cells, even a lot of the standard solar cells that are commercially available, they, they tend to be encapsulated uh, to prevent moisture and air from getting in anyhow. So these are OK. I mean, we do it in, in the lab, not in a special glove box or anything. Once we, make the, once we make the dots, those have to be done without air. But once we make them and we have them out, it, it's, it's relatively stable. But um, it's not 30 years stable, right? See, for solar cells, you know, if you're going to commercialize them and sell them, you're, people are looking at 30-year lifetimes. And these are not yet there. But if they were encapsulated, they could be um, probably uh, quite a bit longer than they are just sitting out in the room. Yeah. Is there uh, an easy route to, to a high uh, volume manufacturing of these types of materials and devices? Yeah, I always say yes, even though thankfully I don't have to figure out how. <laughs> so um, I think generally people think that uh, these solution methods, you, you can make quantum dots um, and small particles of semiconductors relatively cheaply. You know, I don't know if anybody's really done the cost analysis yet. These are pretty new types of solar cells. The, the quantum dot solar cells, uh, but it, it has to be scalable and, and done cheaply or nobody's going to be interested in, in eventually doing them. So most of the techniques used here are either sort of standard sputter deposition, which can definitely be scaled and mass produced, or uh, produced from solution. So, yeah? Kind of following on to that, um, where do you see the solar industry going in the next few years? I mean, I've heard a lot of uh, negativity surrounding quantum dot solar cells and a lot. You have? Yeah. Dang. And a lot more, of course, like incremental improvements in silicon. Yes. Or yeah. potentially organics um, or perovskites. Uh, where do you think it's going? Yeah, I was following you until you said organics, but uh, okay. So, um, yeah, I agree with you or what you've heard that there, first of all, this is something that's for sort of next, next generation. So part of it is to understand where we can go from what we have now. What, what people are really looking at and interested in is silicon, right? I mean, silicon's been around for uh, several decades. It's the, by far the most uh, prevalent among commercialized cells. And um, it's had a whole resurgence because prices have come down a lot. Uh, I think with the, one of the interesting futures of uh, solar cells other than what we're working on, like the quantum dot stuff, is thin silicon. So thin film silicon that you can make crystal in so that you can get all the benefits that people were really interested in with things like CAD telluride or SIGs or CZTS um, and maybe even perovskites. But you could do it with silicon because silicon is abundant. It's stable. We know it has great electronic properties if you can make it right. So I think that's one of the futures. And you mentioned perovskites, which is the hot topic right now in solar cells as of about a year ago. So these are materials that are kind of a hybrid inorganic metals and also organics that have remarkably high efficiencies. I think they're probably almost up to 20%. I can't remember the exact number. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in those. But those have major stability issues. Um, and they also, like our quantum dots, contain lead, which you know it's fine to be doing at the research scale. But if you're trying to um, sell these uh, at large scale, people are hesitant to incorporate toxic um, things like lead. So there, there, there's some issues they have to overcome, but that's a very big, exciting area of solar cell research right now. Um, and uh, things are shifting very quickly in the solar cell research uh, area and also the industry. I mean, there, in this area, three years ago, there were lots of companies, startups, uh, looking at technologies that looked really promising, and they're not around anymore. So it's a fast-changing field right now. And it makes it exciting. More questions? Uh,